Unlimited Hearing, hearingunlimited.com. Views expressed are those of the host, guests, and callers, not necessarily those of News Radio 1040 WHO. Good morning, friends. Welcome to our Monday morning get together. I'm going to have to hit the ground running real hard here today because we're going to have a formal debate uh, during the first segment. You might have had an opportunity to see the movie Expelled, it has a movie about uh, intelligent design. Part of the movie. Uh, is devoted to the assertion that uh, without Darwinism, Nazism would be impossible. Uh, that notion didn't settle well with uh, Professor Hector Avalos up at uh, ISU, who is a professor of religious studies there. And he'd like to challenge one of the presenters in the uh, uh, Expelled the Movie, uh, Richard Weichart, who's written on this subject, From Darwin to Hitler. And we're going to have a formal debate on the uh, on the subject was... Uh, uh, to what degree was uh, Darwinism an influence on Nazism, Nazism or was uh, Darwinism more important than uh, Christian anti-Judaism in explaining Nazi ideology? We're going to have uh, uh, the affirmative uh, speak for about five minutes. Uh, Professor Richard Weichart is research fellow at the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture, professor of history at California State University. In fact, he uh, uh, did some of his academic work at the University of Iowa in 94. Has written uh, on this subject uh, a book called his dissertation, Socialist Darwinism, Evolution in German Socialism, uh, Socialist Thought from uh, Marx to Bernstein, and his book uh, From Darwin to Hitler was uh, focused, uh, a a focus of the movie Expelled. Representing the other side of this, Professor uh, Hector Avalos, Professor of Religious Studies at ISU, uh, has a prolific um, a very prolific pen. His first is education, uh, University, uh, Harvard University in 91, Ph.D., Harvard Divinity School, uh, and Bachelor of Anthropology, University of uh, Arizona. Several uh, areas of expertise, biblical and Near East studies, uh, U.S. Latino religious literature, uh, the association between religion and violence. He has several books, uh, The Able-Bodied, Rethinking Disabilities in Biblical Studies, The End of Biblical Studies, Stranger in Our Own Land, and Fighting Words, The Origins of Religious Violence. Uh, and with uh, that way too quick and, uh, and way uh, too uh, uh, cursory overview, gentlemen, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, Professor uh, and uh, Richard Weichart, the uh, forum belongs to you for five minutes. Let her rip. Okay. I want to thank uh, Professor Avalos for initiating this discussion about an important question. First, I want to say that I thoroughly agree with Professor Avalos that Christian anti-Judaism was an important influence on Nazi ideology. Nazism was not drawn from any one source. So how can we know if Darwinism or Christian anti-Judaism was more important, which is the focus of this debate? I would suggest three questions to help us settle this issue. First, which is more central to Nazi ideology? Hitler's primary goal was to improve the human species, to advance human evolution. In the pivotal chapter of Nation and Race in Mein Kampf, which was the only chapter reprinted individually during the Nazi period showing its pivotal role, Hitler began and framed the entire discussion about race as an evolutionary issue. On the second page of the chapter, after discussing the struggle for existence, he stated, quote, And struggle is always a means for improving a species' health and power of resistance, and therefore a cause of its higher evolution. Hitler began his second book with a long discussion about evolution and the struggle for existence. In speeches about the Nazi worldview, Hitler always claimed that the struggle for existence was a central element of his ideology. Okay, the second question. Which of these two can explain more dimensions of Nazi ideology? Christian anti-Judaism influenced only one dimension of Nazi ideology, and this one only partially, and that's its anti-Semitism. As important as anti-Semitism is in Nazi ideology, Nazi ideology contained many other points that had nothing to do with anti-Semitism. The following seven aspects of Nazi ideology were heavily influenced by Darwinism, but not by Christian anti-Judaism. First, Nazi eugenics policies, which were forthrightly based on Darwinist thought. This included the compulsory sterilization of the disabled, forced abortions for the disabled, as well as beginning in 1939, killing the disabled. These were all supposed to drive human evolution forward. Number two, the drive for population expansion. Darwin claimed in The Descent of Man that the birth rate should not be limited because a higher birth rate was advantageous for evolution. Hitler often expressed the exact same view. Number three, 
the need for living space. The Darwinian biologist turned geographer Friedrich Ratzel had argued that the struggle for existence was essentially a struggle for space. Hitler often expressed the need for living space in overtly Darwinian terms. This drove his militarism and resulted in the beginning of World War II when he took over Poland to try to gain living space. Number four, racial inequality. Darwin and Heckel both argued that human inequality uh, on the ba- uh, argued for rather human inequality on the basis of Darwinian evolution. That is, there's variation within the species and races are unequal. Number five, anti-Marxism. Ernst Heckel, the leading German Darwinist, argued that Darwinism disproved Marxism because it disproved human equality. Number six, history as a racial struggle for existence. Darwin believed that uh, the races were in a struggle for existence and said, quote, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races, quote, close. This idea of a racial struggle for existence did impact Hitler's anti-Semitism as well. Number seven, the evolution of moral traits. Hitler, in his famous speech, Why Are We Anti-Semites in 1920, claimed that uh, that Jews had evolved bad moral traits and that Aryans had evolved good moral traits. Hitler's anti-Semitism was biological. It was not based on religion. Okay, my third and final question. Which ideology, Christianity and Christian anti-Judaism or Darwinism, did Hitler and leading Nazis embrace? Well, Hitler embraced Darwinism both publicly and in many private conversations. However, If we look at Hitler's private conversations, we find out that he normally expressed contempt for Christianity. He often criticized Christianity, especially its ethic of compassion, precisely because he thought it violated the laws of nature, especially the Darwinian struggle for existence. Okay, compared to Darwinism then, Christian anti-Judaism is not as central a theme in the Nazi worldview. It did not influence as many aspects of Nazi ideology. And neither Hitler nor most leading Nazis actually embraced Christian anti-Judaism, though they may have used it propagandistically at times to score political points. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, That is uh, the voice of uh, our first debater, and his uh, name is uh, Professor Richard Weichart. Now, Professor Avalos, sir. Okay. Uh, Well, thank you very much for allowing uh, us to debate and Dr. Weichart for uh, uh, agreeing to participate. Uh, First, let's clarify the debate question to which Dr. Weichart has agreed. The question is, is Darwinism more important than Christian anti-Judaism in explaining the Nazi Holocaust? So Dr. Weichart cannot rest content with just showing the influence of Darwinism on Nazism. He has agreed to show that Darwinism was more important. Uh, Second, it is important to know that on page 9 of his book, From Darwin to Hitler, he has defined Darwinism as the theory of evolution, quote, the theory of evolution through natural selection as advanced by Darwin's In the Origin of Species, unquote. That book was published in 1859. Notice he's now quoting other books that he did not include in that definition, but I'll allow him to move the goalpost if he wishes. Now, the reason I think he's wrong is this. Christians had been persecuting, killing, and exiling Jews for about 1900 years prior to the establishment of the Nazi regime uh, in 1933, and they did it without Darwinism. One example is provided by Martin Luther, uh, the father of Protestantism in 1543. He published a very infamous tract called On the Jews and Their Lies, in which he outlined a seven-point plan against the Jews. So let me briefly read his seven points. These are his own words in the standard translation of Luther's works in English. So let me start with the seven points. Quote, First, to set fire to their synagogues or schools and to bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn so that no man will ever again see a stone or cinder of them. This is to be done in honor of our Lord and Christendom so that God might see that we are Christians and do not condone or knowingly tolerate such public lying, cursing, blaspheming of his sons or of his Christians. Second, 
I advise that their houses also be razed and destroyed. Third, I advise that all their prayer books and Talmudic writings in which such idolatry, lies, cursing, and blasphemy are taught be taken from them. Fifth, I advise that safe conduct on the highways be abolished completely for the Jews. Sixth, I advise that usury be prohibited to them and that all cash and treasures of silver and gold be taken from them for safekeeping. Seventh, I recommend putting a flail, an axe, a hoe, a distaff, or a spindle into the hands of, of young, strong Jews and Jewesses and letting them earn their bread in the sweat of their brow and was imposed on the children of Adam. Unquote. Note now, every single element from killing disobedient Jews to consigning Jews to hard labor, as in Nazi labor camps, is paralleled by the Nazi plan. That is why even Franklin Sherman, the Lutheran editor of Luther's work, not an atheist, was moved to make this statement in that very volume. Quote, it is impossible to publish Luther's treatise today, however, without noting how similar his proposals were to the actions of the National Socialist regime in the 1930s and 40s. Now, given such a history of Christian anti-Judaism, could you, Dr. Weichart, answer these three questions for the audience? Number one, how do you explain the fact that Luther had a plan similar to the Nazis in 1543 and without the benefit of Darwinism? Two, why didn't you mention in your book, From Darwin to Hitler, the fact that Luther had a plan similar to the Nazis hundreds of years before Darwin? And third, could you give us a passage from On the Origin of Species, which you said was how you define Darwinism, that outlines anything similar to Luther's seven-point plan for the Jews? And so I await those Responses, Dr. Weigert. Yeah, we will take a, a brief time out at this point. We're in the middle of a debate <laughs> conversation about uh, Darwinism and uh, Nazism. We have two in one in studio guests, Professor Avalos from ISU, uh, a graduate from University of Iowa, Dr. Weichart, who has uh, written on the uh, subject from uh, Darwin to Hitler. Back in a moment. Right now in the studio with us, Professor Hector Avalos from ISU and uh, Dr. Richard Weichart, uh, research fellow at Discovery Institute, debating Darwinism and um, the link between Darwinism and uh, Nazism. Is there a necessary link? Dr. Richard Weichart, it is your turn. Okay, first of all, Professor Avalos claimed that I moved the goalpost because he quotes my definition of uh, Darwinism on page 9 of my book. Apparently he forgot to read the rest of my book, because in the rest of my book I show very clearly how those two, the ideas of evolution through natural selection uh, did impact uh, historically, many other kinds of ideas, and I listed seven of those key ideas that influenced Nazi ideology, and the Nazis did use the idea of evolution by natural selection when they justified those particular ideas. Uh, so I did not move the goalposts. I'm just showing historically how influence worked. Uh, I want to approach the thing then that Professor Avalos posed me some questions. It seems rather bizarre to me that Professor Avalos claims that Luther's seven points about anti-Semitism, which he read for us, are the same as Hitler's ideology or even the same as Hitler's anti-Semitism. To give one example, Avalos plays up the idea that Luther advocated killing Jews. However, while I don't defend Luther for his religious persecution, let's be precise about this. Luther advocated killing only Jewish rabbis who continued illegally teaching Judaism. I admit that Luther's position is horrendous, but does Professor Avalos really think that this is the same as Hitler's vision of killing all Jews men, women, and children, irrespective of their behavior? Is he trying to say that Christian anti-Judaism in the past that did result in many atrocities, admittedly, uh, is uh, the same as a killing of six million, and Hitler, Hitler would have killed more if he'd had time? Luther, uh, to just give a key example of how his, his, uh, those seven points were hugely different than Nazi ideology, Luther wanted to convert Jews to Lutheranism, while Hitler opposed converting Jews to Christianity, because Hitler thought that this would introduce their supposedly inferior racial traits into the German gene pool. Most scholars note that there was a huge shift in anti-Semitic ideology in the late 19th century that Professor Avalos doesn't acknowledge. Anti-Semitism was secularized then, resulting in a stress on racial anti-Semitism rather than religious persecution. 
Many leading anti-Semites, including those who influenced Hitler and the early Nazi movement, such as Theodor Fritsch, Willibald Henschel, Julius Friedrich Lehmann, uh, embraced this racial anti-Semitism. And I should uh, note that all of those uh, were staunch Darwinists, too, in their interpretation of racism and racial anti-Semitism. Hitler, in his first anti-Semitic writing in 1919, explicitly argued that anti-Semitism was not based on religion, but on race. He upheld this position throughout his career. Uh, there were many aspects of Hitler's anti-Semitism that had nothing to do with anti-Judaism, but are closely connected to Darwinist ideas. The idea of biological racism rather than racial, uh, ra- excuse me, rather than religious discrimination. The idea of the racial struggle for existence between Jews and Aryans. He very often couched his anti-Semitism as idea of this racial struggle for existence. And the problem of racial mixture, which didn't have anything to do with Luther's points. He thought it harmed human evolution. So in these ways and many others, uh, some, many aspects of Hitler's anti-Semitism had nothing to do with, uh, with the anti-Judaism. Professor Avalos. Uh, well, I, I think that I, all, all I have to do is read uh, his definition of Darwinism, uh, and you can see for yourself whether he moved the goalpost. He said, on page 9, When I use the term Darwinism in this study, I mean the theory of evolution through natural selection as advanced by Darwin in the origin of species. So uh, maybe he just should have redefined uh, what he wanted to talk about, but he also criticized other scholars for redefining their uh, definitions. But let me get back to this Luther thing. Uh, Dr. Weichart insists that uh, it, they're very different, uh, Luther's plan from uh, uh, Hitler's plan. But in fact, what I just quoted was uh, a Lutheran scholar's own assessment, and he says that they're very similar. So Dr. Weichart is in disagreement with even Luther scholars. But let me give you a couple more uh, similarities. Kristallnacht, the uh, horrendous um, destruction of Jewish synagogues and other Jewish-owned businesses in 1938 uh, is paralleled. by That's the first point of, of Luther's plan. You destroy their synagogues. And when did Kristallnacht take place? Well, it took place on Luther's birthday. Now, that may be a sure coincidence, but uh, some people don't think there is a coincidence there. Second, if you read Mein Kampf, uh, you will find that on page 213 of the Mannheim English edition, uh, uh, Hitler says this, quote, Besides Frederick the Great, stand Martin Luther, as well as Richard Wagner. Now, Dr. Weichart, tell me, where in Mein Kampf does Hitler ever quote Darwin for any of his rationales uh, and uh, policies? Go ahead, Professor. Okay, uh, concerning, uh, I'll take the last question first about does Hitler ever quote Darwin? Uh, Hitler, as far as I know, never used the word Darwin, uh, and certainly not in Mein Kampf he didn't. However, he does use the word evolution quite frequently, uh, he, uh, the German word is Entwicklung. Unfortunately, uh, Mannheim often translates this as development, which is a correct translation of the word Entwicklung at times, but uh, in the context of biological evolution, Entwicklung is the word that German biologists use uh, to, uh, for evolution. Entwicklung's theorie is the uh, evolution. So Hitler does often talk about evolution. I already indicated that at the beginning of his pivotal chapter on nation and race, he has an extended uh, discussion of uh, evolution, there. Also, if you look at many of his speeches, especially his secret speeches that he gave during World War II to uh, officers, he quite often uh, uses uh, the term evolution. He even discusses, uh, he gives, he discusses the concept of natural selection. You say I'm moving the goalpost, but I am using the definition of evolution by natural selection. Uh, Hitler clearly laid out evolution by natural selection, claimed there's a population increase, just like Darwin did. He claimed that uh, this led to a competition between the, the uh, individuals and races within the species. Uh, H- Hitler laid it out constantly in his secret speeches, in his private conversations. You look at the table talks, he constantly is talking about evolution. In fact, Hitler's secretary, Jungo Traude, uh, or excuse me, uh, Traudel Junge, rather, excuse me, I got it inverted. Traudel Junge said that Hitler often criticized Christianity, but approved of human evolution. She says that in her uh, uh, biography, or autobiography. Uh, there are many, many other uh, examples I could give of Hitler uh, stating quite forthrightly that he believes in evolution, and including human evolution, uh, both in his table talks, his secret speeches, his speeches about the Nazi worldview. Hitler said this again and again and again. He doesn't necessarily say Darwin's name, but he talks about evolution. He discusses the concept. 
so what we're talking about here is the concept of evolution and Darwinism. We're not necessarily saying he had to have said Darwin's name. There is actually one account where someone does claim he mentioned Darwin, uh, one of his adjutants, uh, uh, Otto Wagner, claimed that Hitler did explicitly use the name Darwin. I don't know if that's true or not. It was written later on. Uh, but Hitler does uh, quite often uh, quote from Darwin. Whether uh, or not uh, Darwin says certain things in The Origin of Species, uh, Darwin said nothing about human evolution in The Origin of Species other than what light might be shed on it. It was later in The Descent of Man that Darwin began applying Darwinism to humanity, and that's uh, what this uh, debate of influence is all about. So I'm not moving the goalposts. I'm simply showing how both Darwin, after the uh, Origin of Species, as well as other Darwinists later on, applied these ideas to humanity, and Hitler did likewise. Professor Avalos. Uh, well, I, I've done a lot of work on uh, pro-slavery uh, advocacy in uh, the, the South. And uh, when he says that uh, this idea of natural selection is really Darwinist, um, I guess he hasn't read enough of this uh, pro-slavery racialist literature uh, in, in the American South. So, so let me just quote a couple of items which show that certainly this idea that uh, the strong should dispossess the weak and oppress the weak is not really uh, a Darwinist idea. Uh, here is uh, an example from 1850, which would be before 1859, from Robert Knox. Robert Knox was a racialist writer, Scottish, and he said this in a book called The Races of Man. Quote, now whether the earth be overpopulated or not, one thing is certain. The strong will always grasp at the property and lands of the weak. I have been assured that this is compatible with the highest moral, even Christian, feeling. So even if it were the case that a lot of these people thought natural law, natural selection favored the strong, they found it compatible with Christianity. They found no incompatibility, and the same goes for Hitler. Hitler was a creationist. He thought that natural law was created by God and that this natural law was supposed to result in the extermination of the weak because that's what racialist literature in the American South also said before Darwin. Uh, here's a second example from George Fitzhugh, an American pro-slavery ad uh, advocate. You can find it in the antebellum writings of George Fitzhugh, 1854, so before 1859, and he says this, quote, Members of Congress of the Young American Party boast that the Anglo-Saxon race is manifestly destined to eat out all other races as the wire grass destroys and takes the place of other grasses. Well, that sounds a lot like natural selection to me, where uh, naturally stronger species will replace weaker species or weaker groups. That has nothing to do with Darwinism necessarily, and the population issues he mentioned, he, he knows well, those are not Darwinists. They go back to Thomas Malthus. Uh, and, and so, again, he is ascribing to Darwinism, especially in The Origin of Species. That's how he defines it. Uh, the Origin of Species book. Nothing in there about exterminating Jews, but you do find it in Luther. And, and incredibly, Hitler says Luther is one of his heroes, not Darwin. I'll take a break at this point. We'll come back in a moment. You just heard the voice of Professor Hector Avalos from ISU. And uh, we're also in the middle of a, this is a formal debate, folks. I'm not involved except trying to keep the, the, the time here. Uh, Dr. Richard Weichardt is on the other side of the aisle. He is from Discovery Institute. Uh, Professor Avalos is from ISU. Back in a moment, right after Ken Root updates us on our farm market. For delicious new I can't remember ever doing a formal debate on this program before. We're doing one now, though. Dr. Richard Weichart is, represents Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. His book is called From Darwin to Hitler. In the studio with this, representing uh, himself and who is a representative of uh, ISU, a uh, prolific writer and uh, critic of uh, intelligent design and creationism, is uh, Dr. Hector Avalos. Uh, Dr. Richard Weichart, it is your turn, sir. Okay, Professor Avalos quoted from a number of racial thinkers before Darwin's time and claimed that somehow this disproves my idea that these are Darwinian ideas. It doesn't at all. Darwin incorporated many ideas of racist thinkers of his time into uh, his thinking about race uh, in The Descent of Man. I'm sorry that Professor Avalos doesn't like me quoting from The Descent of Man, which is Darwin's major book about human evolution uh, written after the origin, but uh, it certainly had a huge impact on people, and he, Darwin was applying natural selection and evolution to the human species. Uh, and he does, and I quoted earlier from that uh, 
piece a part that said, quote, at some future period not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races. Now, Darwin wasn't saying we should go out and kill people, but he was saying that this was a natural process, uh, and it is part of his theory, uh, not just uh, the theory of racist thinkers before him. Yes, it was uh, there were racist thinkers that put forward the idea before him, but that doesn't make it a non-Darwinian idea, and Darwin does uh, explain it quite uh, thoroughly. Also, I've examined in great detail in my book From Darwin to Hitler uh, and elsewhere the racial thinkers of the late 19th and early 20th century that would have influenced Nazi ideology. Uh, people like Ludwig Voltmann, uh, Ludwig Schemann, who was the leader of the Gobineau Society, uh, Theodor Fritsch, uh, and I could give uh, dozens of other names of leading racial thinkers in Germany who very overtly drew upon Darwinism, claimed to be synthesizing Darwinism into their uh, racial thinking, who used the idea of natural selection and overpopulation, population pressure, and perfect. And Professor Avalos even mentioned Malthus a little bit ago. Uh, I'm not sure if he realizes this, but uh, Darwin very overtly said that Malthus was where he got his idea for natural selection. So to say that something is, a, is an idea from Malthus does not mean it's non-Darwinian. In fact, it means it is Darwinian. And Darwin was drawing upon Malthus. So just to say that it's a Malthusian idea does not mean it's not a Darwinian idea as well. Professor Avalos has never yet talked about any of the uh, racial thinkers of the period that Hitler could have been reading and that many of his contemporaries were reading to try to show whether that they were not influenced by Darwinism, which they were. Uh, to be sure, there was still influence of Christian anti-Judaism. I already conceded this at the very start. Uh, Christian anti-Judaism was an influence on Nazi ideology. I've never denied uh, such a thing, but he uh, doesn't seem aware that Darwinism was a huge influence on uh, anti-Semitism and racial thought. And he also has never addressed any of the other issues that I raised about Nazi eugenics policies, about the living space idea, and many other key aspects of Nazi ideology that had a lot to do with Darwinism, but had absolutely nothing to do uh, with Christian anti-Judaism. Uh, I'll get to the issue of Hitler being a creationist in one of my later responses, uh, I hope, which is also a very fanciful claim. Hitler was not a creationist, and I can prove that. Professor Avalos. Uh, well, Dr. Weichert, I, I don't mind you using the descent of man. I just don't know why you define your study as confined to the origin of species. You should have just said, I define Darwinism as whatever occurs in his work. If, if an idea occurs before Darwin, then it does show uh, that it, it's not necessary to just uh, attribute it to Darwin. It, it existed before, so the, the, the Nazis could have used those ideas without Darwinism. All of the ideas you've, you are mentioning have been found in racialist literature before Darwin. They don't need Darwin uh, for their ideas. But the quote you mentioned about the extension of the races by Darwin is one of the most often uh, misrepresented quotes, and, and Dr. Weichert has repeated it very often in blog posts. But uh, this is like arguing that uh, Al Gore must be against uh, or must be for the extinction of penguins because he, he's reporting that uh, Penguins might be extinguished if, if, if ex extinguished if the global warming crisis uh, continues. Uh, it, Al Gore is no, not endorsing the extinction of penguins any more than Darwin was endorsing the extinction of the races. In fact, he was lamenting the fact uh, that other writers, and, and this is a quote from The Descent of Man, page 543 of my edition, quote, but there is no lament in any writer of that period over the perishing barbarians, unquote. So... Uh, he's reporting what's, what's been happening to barbarians. He's not endorsing. He, in fact, is lamenting a completely different view than you get here. Um, but let me go back just briefly uh, to the idea of inequality that he mentions. Uh, he, he says that evolution requires variation, and Darwin and other Darwinists believe in human inequality. Well, that's fine. But you have to know that that's also uh, a very Christian uh, tradition, at least if in, in regard to the Jews. Uh, here is a an edict by Pope Paul IV, and that edict started the segregation of Jews into ghettos. And he begins that edict by saying, uh, quote, Gil has consigned them to perpetual servitude. He goes on to say that the Jews, quote, should recognize through experience that they have been made slaves while Christians have been made free through Jesus. So you don't need Darwinism to supply that kind of inequality. And it doesn't really explain why the Jews are, are supposed to be unequal in this way. Darwin never mentioned the inequality of Jews, but Christian writers, popes, Luther, all did. 
Uh, we will take a break at this time. We'll have uh, time for some uh, additional give and take, and we'll have two formal three-minute segments at the end where our in-studio guests and online guests can close and summarize. Back in a moment. As usual, during this kind of a program, the time is our enemy, and the clock is going to tick away on us. So I think what we'll do, uh, gentlemen, uh, it will allow you guys to do your closing comments right now. And uh, that way, we'll have uh, absolute certainty everybody gets uh, their own last words. Uh, Dr. Weichart, you get uh, the first three minutes for, for closing, and you'll be followed by uh, Professor Avalos. Dr. Weichart. Okay. Uh I maintain that I have demonstrated that Darwinism is more central to Nazi ideology by uh, addressing the questions that I addressed at, at first. It was more central to Nazi ideology. Uh, it answers more, it explains more dimensions of Nazi ideology. Professor Avalos did not even uh, address most of those aspects of Nazi ideology that I raised, such as Nazi, Nazi eugenics policies, which resulted in killing of uh, about 200,000 disabled people the drive for population expansion, which Darwin himself uh, espoused in The Descent of Man, and that Hitler also embraced, the need for living space, uh, which was one of the key factors beginning World War II. This was not just a minor factor. I mean, this was a huge factor, uh, and it was based upon Darwinian concepts of the struggle for existence and the need for more resources for the uh, expanding population that was uh, engaging in a struggle for existence with the different races. Uh, and it uh, specifically pushed him toward uh, what he considered uh, inferior races uh, toward the East. Uh, the idea of racial inequality, which Darwin and Heckel both uh, believed was based upon human variation on the basis of uh, their Darwinist ideas. The idea of anti-Marxism, which Heckel, Ernst Heckel, the leading German Darwinist and others, believed uh, Darwinism disproved it because it disproved human inequality, excuse me, it disproved human equality. Uh, history is a racial struggle for existence. This is the only one that Professor Avalos actually really addressed uh, at all. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, the evolution of moral traits, that the Jews had evolved uh, immoral uh, biological characteristics, uh, whereas the uh, uh, Aryans had uh, evolved uh, good moral characteristics, which is why he wanted to uh, uh, exterminate them. Uh, all of Hitler's programs that I've mentioned here, as well as the Holocaust itself, were designed to try to advance human evolution. And Hitler says this quite explicitly time and time again in secret speeches, in private conversations, in the table talks, uh, in Mein Kampf itself, in his second book, and in many, many other uh, venues. Professor Avalos claimed that Hitler was a creationist. Uh, I, I'm going to give lots of evidence in my forthcoming book. I'm writing a book right now on Hitler's ideology, which is going to sh disprove this. Let me just give one example of that. That's all I have time for. In an extended conversation about evolution on October 24, 1941, Hitler lambasted Christianity, claiming that evolutionary science showed the poverty of the Church's dogmas. He then stated, quote, There have been humans at the rank at least of a baboon, in any case, for 300,000 years at least. Even though Hitler did believe in some kind of God that created natural laws, one of the natural laws Hitler thought that the God had created was the struggle for existence uh, and evolutionary processes that could explain uh, the racial struggle for existence uh, and thus lead to Nazi atrocities. Thank you. Thank you indeed, uh, Professor Richard Weichart from Discovery Institute. Professor Avalos from ISU. Well, Dr. Walker, thank you for making my point. You just said that uh, Hitler believed God had created natural law. That makes him a creationist by definition, so thank you very much for that point. But uh, let me say this. Uh, Dr. Weichart agreed to show that Darwinism was more important than Christian anti Judaism. He did not do that. In fact, historically, he cannot do that. Instead, he wants to erase 1,900 years of Christian anti Judaism to seemingly blame Darwin, which is a standard subterfuge used by creationists and believers in intelligent design. They want to convince the public that believing in a creator would avoid the human catastrophe supposedly brought by belief in evolution. But now Dr. Walker just told us that Hitler believed God had created these natural laws. So creationism doesn't avoid those problems. Belief in a creator actually creates more moral chaos because now um, moral beliefs are really dependent on unverifiable beliefs about what God wants. There never has and can never be agreement on who is rightly representing God's moral directives. 
strategically, I think his argument also makes no sense. Uh, in, in order for Nazi leadership to convince millions of Germans that their mission was justified, they would have to use something that already would predispose people to persecute Jews. In this case, the anti-Judaism found in German history and in the Bible for a much more convenient source than Darwin, which most Germans had probably never read. Even Dr. Weichart tells us that Darwin is never quoted by Hitler, uh, but, but Hitler does refu uh, refer to uh, Luther. In short, uh, coming back to the movie Expel, which is um, what the problem is that started this debate, it's really a movie that tries to use bad history to make emotional arguments against evolution because they know they lost their case in the scientific community. The only thing that remains for intelligent designers is to use a propaganda film uh, and political pressure to make up for their utter lack of credibility uh, in the scientific community. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Avalos, and thank you, uh, Dr. Weichart, for your participation and your spirited debate here, gentlemen. Uh, this whole conversation will be up on the net this afternoon in our podcast form, as usual, at whoradio.com. You'll be able to hear it again. You'll be able to chase the links of the various uh, debaters. Later this morning, we're going to talk with Meg Meeker. She's going to tell you, let boys be boys, and she has good reasons for that. Craig Nelson is a researcher from an organization called Project USA and says the uh, shoes have not fallen completely in the post-fill issue. Well, I'll tell you the rest of the story after the news.